Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man was healed, which was healed, held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up, and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead and whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Now I'm going to give you a heads up. I'm a lot different than a lot of preachers. I'm, I'm not necessarily a verse-by-verse -verse exegist kind of a preacher. You know, a lot of times they read a passage and then they kind of go verse by verse. That, that's not the, the, when the Lord gives me a message, it'll play out a little differently than that. But you'll see what I mean in a minute. Let's go to the Lord one more time. Master, once again, God, we come before the throne of grace. Humbly seeking the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Lord, today I am convinced that only a very foolish person would stand in the sacred desk and seek to preach a message for the benefit of the people of God without first desiring the anointing of the Holy Ghost. There's nothing I can say or do that will benefit any person in this room there is nothing that I can say or do that will benefit any of the wonderful people right now watching live on the internet. Those that might watch live later, might listen later. Master, today I need the touch of the Holy Ghost. I need you to quicken my mind to help me to articulate to the church today the word that you've given me for this hour. Help me, O oh God, but more than this, touch as well the ear of every hearer. Help us to have a heart and a mind that is receptive to the word of the Lord. 
that we might hear what the Spirit would say unto the church at this hour. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. We are a Spirit-filled church. We believe that the church that was established on the day of Pentecost is the same identical church that Jesus Christ is coming for one day. Amen. A lot of church denominations and organizations will try to tell you that the church we read about in the book of Acts is, uh, you know, a church that was empowered by God, a church that experienced miracles and signs and wonders, but they will tell you that that was then and this is now. Things are different today than they were then. No, they are not. Amen. God's church is one singular church from the day of Pentecost until the rapture. Hallelujah. He wants his people to walk in the power and in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. But there is a reason for this. And it has little, if anything at all, to do with us. No, it has to do with God's purpose. It has to do with God's plan. It has to do with God's reasoning. A Holy Ghost-filled, fire-baptized church is very much different than many of the modern temples of boredom <laughs> and bashing that we find on every other street corner in America today. The truth today is that the church is a carrier not only of the message of a risen Christ, a resurrected Christ, but also of the power and presence of that same Jesus. Hallelujah. Now instead of ministering upon the earth as a single human being, the Lord Jesus Christ today ministers in the world through His people. Hallelujah. So instead of being confined to one body and therefore being only able to minister to those that are in His immediate surroundings, now through the people of God, the Spirit of the Lord is able to minister to people all over the world. Hallelujah. In Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, he made this statement. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. The Lord's deity, His divinity was demonstrated and revealed through miraculous signs and wonders. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Oh, but you see, Peter said, a man approved of God. He said, God showed you who this man was. How? Through miraculous signs and wonders. Mm -hmm. The problem is, the church has gone off the rails. God called me, at least he told me he did when I was a young man, to a prophetic ministry. So when I preach, I tend oftentimes, I'll address issues and problems, frankly, in the church. Not, not in our church, in the church. Okay? Well, let me tell you. We got a lot of preachers nowadays. I'm not going to name names like Benny Hinn and things like that. I'm not going to say these kind of names. But we got preachers who act like the purpose of miracles and signs and wonders is somehow to make them look uh -huh. like something. To make them appear as though they have some special relationship with God or they have some special anointing from the Holy Ghost. And honestly, a lot of Christians have fallen into that erroneous mindset. We look at preachers 
we look at ministers whom the Lord may use in certain areas and we tend to kind of elevate them and hold them up. We live in a culture today where celebrity, for some reason, just makes you special. If you've got enough money to get on TV and be famous enough, all of a sudden people believe that your ministry is somehow more greatly blessed by God than this poor little preacher in Huntsville, Alabama who can't get people to come to church. Am I telling the truth? I know I am. Oh, if you can get enough people... Oh yeah, you drive by a church and they've got hundreds if not thousands of cars in their parking lot and you go home and you turn on your TV and you see their edifice filled with thousands of people. All of a sudden you immediately ascribe to that preacher some sort of special anointing. All of a sudden you ascribe to that preacher that perhaps they're more greatly blessed than other preachers. Because after all, look what the Lord's given them. Folks, do I have to remind you? Apparently I do. The Word of God said in the last days they shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. And what that means is that Christians, people who identify as Christian, are going to elevate leaders and teachers and preachers because that leader, that preacher, says what tickles their ear. That person says what they want to hear. I always laugh when I see these people on TV who are supposed to be so-called prophets. And if you ever look at them, watch them. Everything they got to say is positive. Everything they got to say is good. Everything they've got to say is, Oh, you're about to be elevated. Hallelujah. God's about to open the door for you. Oh, that blessing you've been waiting on is about to come. Never once hear them say, Honey, you need to submit yourself to the Lord because you're not acting right, you're not doing right. And the reason God can't bless you is because you haven't learned yet to submit yourself. Am I telling the truth? No, you never hear them say that because nobody wants to hear that. Everything they say is always so positive and so lovely what everybody wants to hear. Nobody resists what these so-called prophets have to say. Well, I'm here to tell you today, folks, we live in an age where celebrity has become so powerful, I don't want to get political, but look at our politics today. Some of the most wicked, evil people on this planet are getting involved in politics and they're being supported by millions and millions of Americans. And why? Why? What, what credentials have they? Oh, they're a big celebrity. They're known by millions. No, they're not known by millions. They're seen by millions. They're not known by millions. I got news for you, honey. If you think you know the Pope because you've seen him a time or two on TV. <laughs> Listen, for as often as I've seen him on TV or as often as I've seen any movie star or any TV personality or any celebrity. I don't know the first thing in the world about those people. I couldn't tell you whether they're good people or bad people, nice people or mean people. I have no clue. I, I'm not exposed to enough. And anybody that's got any brains in their head knows how to act right when the camera's on. <laughs> Come on now. I'm not foolish. I know when that camera's on, I better keep my cool and I better watch my tone and watch how I say things. I'm not crazy. I know how it works. But you see, that way we control the information that goes out. And yet we see preachers on TV that have large followings. We don't know anything about those people. Not a thing in the world. But because they have built up such an enormous following, and, and again, I'm going to say this. Look again at the political environment in America today. Do you really need a lesson in 
how gullible and foolish a lot of Americans are. I used to think that Americans, you know, I thought the majority of Americans were pretty smart people. I thought the majority of Americans were, you know, had a good head on their shoulders and couldn't necessarily be easily bamboozled. But in the last several years, that opinion has completely reversed itself. I've completely come to a whole different mindset. I've realized that no, uh, nearly half this country is about as dumb as a brick. And I mean, honestly, I say that honestly. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm saying that honestly. About half this country is about as goofy as they come. So guess what? If they're as goofy as they are, that they can so easily be led to follow after this character over here, what makes you think they're any more discerning when it comes to spiritual leaders? Mm -hmm. What makes you think they're any more discerning when it comes to the preachers they follow on TV mm -hmm. and the preachers they send their money into? No, I want to tell you, there is a purpose for signs and wonders. There is a reason that God operates in this fashion. There is a reason why God heals the sick. And I don't know about you, but I still believe God heals the sick. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I've been on the other end of the coin too many times. I've been on the hot end of the firearm too many times. I've had doctors look at me more than once and tell me that I'd be dead within 24 hours. Seriously, no, I'm not even joking. Back in 1989, the year I came out, I wound up contracting uh, Lyme's disease. They prescribed for me tetracycline. I went home and I was taking the tetracycline. The next morning, I woke up and uh, I had a rash going down my back from the, the back of the uh, top part of my neck all the way down to my tailbone. My eyes had literally, they didn't turn bloodshot. They literally just went red. The whites of my eyes were solid red. There was no white. My head hurt so bad that trying to get off my bed, I thought my head was just going to roll off onto the floor. It hurt so bad. I'll never forget it. I had to use the restroom. I forced myself to get up and go to the restroom. And every step, oh my God, my, oh my head hurts so bad. Every step was painful. It was a struggle. I went in the bathroom. I walked past the mirror. I looked at the mirror. I said, dear Jesus, what am I looking at? My eyes were solid red. I turned and I saw I could actually see the rash on the side of my neck, you know, going down my back. I said, oh Lord, well... I've heard that one of the signs of uh, Lyme's disease is a rash, but I didn't have a rash before I was diagnosed with Lyme's disease. So I figured, well, maybe it's finally showing up, you know. So I went back to bed after a while, and I laid down, and a few minutes later, my telephone rang. And I answered the phone, and oh, man, I held it to my ear, and hello, and on the other end was the ER doctor that I had seen the night before. And the ER doctor said to me, he said, Charles, how are you feeling today? I said, not good. I said, honestly, I feel a lot worse than I did yesterday. He said, well, you know, you just started the tetracycline and it takes a few days for it to begin to work and everything, you know. He said, so that isn't altogether uncommon. And I said, yeah, I said, I had to go to the bathroom. I said, but my head hurts so bad that I can't hardly lift my head off the pillow. I said, my eyes are solid red. And I said, there's no whites in my eyes. And he said, by any chance, do you have a rash anywhere? I said, yes. I said, I noticed there's a rash. I said, it literally starts on the back of the top of my neck, and it just goes down my spine, practically to my tailbone. And he said, I'm sending an ambulance. He said, you're having an allergic reaction to the tetracycline. Don't take another dose. He said, it could kill you. He said, you're having a very severe reaction. I'm sending an ambulance. Then he said to me, 
I have never in my life called an ER patient that I've seen in the ER. He said, but today, for some reason, he said, I kept hearing a voice saying to me, you need to call that man. 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 He said, it got to the point where it was so pressing and so urgent on me that I needed to call you. He said that I just couldn't get around it. He said, I went to the billing office and said, do you have a phone number for this guy? And I got your phone number. He said, thank God I did said, because if you took another dose of that medicine, you'd probably be dead. Wound up in the hospital, of course, you know, and they had to purge that out of me and treat me. And uh, they told me, they said, you had such a severe reaction to the tetracycline that you easily could have been dead. Now, I'm going to tell you a little secret. When I first came out in 1989, I left the church behind. I thought God didn't want anything to do with me. I thought that the church, uh, you know, the church washed its hands of me. So surely the God of the church washed his hands. Oh, but I'm glad the God of the church and the church of God aren't the same. Hallelujah. Yes. I'm glad today that the God of the church doesn't act the way the people of the church do. Right. And I'm here to tell you, that was the year that I came out. I was doing a lot of nasty things. I was doing some bad things. I thought I was going to hell in a handbasket, so what difference did it make? God hadn't forgotten me. He was still looking out for me. He still had an angel whispering in that doctor's ear, you need to call that guy. You need to call that guy. And then some years later, I went through a situation where I had uh, taken too much of a drug that, uh, not an illicit drug, a, an over-the-counter drug, but anyway, and it had an adverse reaction on my liver. And I wound up in the hospital and they told me, that they said, uh, your, your liver is shot, your liver is completely shot. And they said, we aren't certain we're going to be able to save you. You're in very bad condition. At one point, the doctor came in the room and he asked me, he said, so how are you doing today? And I said to him, I said, well, I said, I, I guess I'm all right. I said, I was here yesterday, and I suppose I'll be here tomorrow. And he looked at me, and he had this puzzled look on his face. And then all of a sudden, he literally got angry. And he said, you don't get it, do you? I'm looking at him. I don't know why all of a sudden his his countenance changed. He said, you don't get it, do you? I said, get what? What are you talking about? He said, I don't even know how you're sitting here talking to me right now. You shouldn't even be conscious. He said, you have broken every norm in the medical books. He said, your liver is gone. It's dead. And you're still sitting here talking to me. He said, it, this shouldn't even be happening. What do I know? I had a God who was still looking out for me. I was out of church. I wasn't acting right. I wasn't doing right. Oh, children, I want to tell you today, there's a lot of people in our community who've given up on God, but what they don't realize is God never once gave up on them. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. What they don't realize is that God is married to the backslider. What they don't realize is that the Lord's love and His grace and His mercy extend so far beyond anything you can imagine that it doesn't matter matter how far away you walk or how far away you slide, you're never going to get outside of his reach. Mm. And he'll still be looking out for you. And he'll still be protecting you. And if we don't know. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people in our community today who are backslidden away from God. They once were in church. They once had a relationship with the Lord. But today, that is not the case. And they don't realize how active our God still is in their lives. Mm. They don't realize how He is still watching their back and protecting them. Oh, back in 2000, I'm going to move on in a minute, but I want you to understand the point I'm making. I believe in a God of miracles. I believe in a God of signs and wonders. 
back in 2000, I wound up in Yelma Haven Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. I had picked up a parasite while I was visiting the United Kingdom. I, did, I didn't know I picked up a parasite, but I had. And it had affected my uh, small, was, no, my large intestine in such a way that food would pass through my body and it would not even begin to uh, nourish my body. It wouldn't even begin to uh, soak into my system. I'd eat it and a short while later, here it come. It all come right out of me. And it literally would come out chewed food. That's what it looked like. Well, for months and months and months, I was going to doctors. I was living in New York City. I was losing weight. Um, I had a hideous case, to be frank, of the runs, and you know, everything just came straight through me. Nobody could figure out what was wrong with me. The doctors couldn't figure out what was going on. Finally, I decided, Lord, I've been asking you to heal me. I've been asking you to touch me. And you haven't done anything yet. I said, I'm afraid that this just might be my time to go home. I said, well, I'm going to go back to Connecticut, my home state where I grew up. It's just one state over from New York. And I said, I'm going to go back to Connecticut. That way, if anything happens to me, my family isn't having to come into New York City to reclaim my body and move it. And, you know, so I'm going to make it easier on my family. So I said, I'm going to go back to Connecticut. There was a man in Connecticut who asked me, said, if you ever leave New York, and uh, I was doing an affirming ministry, trying to do an affirming ministry in New York City. But you can imagine an old, you know, old-fashioned preacher like me. I went over in New York City like a lit brick, pretty much, you know. <laughs> and so we never could really get the support we needed. New York is so expensive. It is such an expensive city. And everything we did cost so much money, you know, and, and we couldn't get support. And uh, I'm happy to have people come to church. Let me tell you, this preacher don't spend any time begging money from nobody, okay? The Lord will meet the need. An old Pentecostal preacher that was a friend of my family growing up as a kid, Brother Warren Tatlock, he used to say, why should I go to the people in the church and, and beg you know, money from them for needs that the church has? He said, they don't have it. He said, I go to the one that's got it. <laughs> well, that's the model I live by. I go to the one that's got it. And you'd be surprised how many times I've talked to the Lord about things. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody come up to me and handed me a check. That literally, this has happened. For the exact amount. Not a dime more, not a dime less. The exact amount I needed at that exact moment. And I never even mentioned it to the church. So see, that's what I'm talking about, living by faith, preaching faith. When you know how to trust the Lord, you don't wind up begging and pleading people money every five minutes. We don't do that here. So anyway, here I am now. Uh, I decided I'm going to go back to Connecticut where I grew up. In case I died, my family wouldn't have to go after me. And I, This one man uh, in Connecticut had told me, he said, if you ever leave New York, he said, I wish you'd think about coming to Connecticut and starting to work here because uh, I'd be thrilled to help you, know, help you do a work. So Harry, uh, I contacted him. I said, Harry, I'm going to leave New York. I'm going to come back to Connecticut. I said, uh, I'm going to work till Jesus comes. The Lord called me to preach, and I'm going to preach. I said, if, I'm, if I die in a year, I die in a year, but I'm going to keep preaching till the Lord comes. So we started to work in Connecticut, and I was preaching, and I was losing weight, and I went through, oh Lord, what I went through. You can't even imagine what I went through. It was quite a time. That summer of 2000, I had three hospitalizations. Two lasted a week. One lasted two weeks. Each time I was hospitalized, I told the doctor, I said, listen, when Sunday comes, y'all are going to have to unhook this ID and let me go preach. I said, I've got, a, I've got about a handful of people. I said, but I'm going to be there to preach because we, we haven't got anybody to fill my shoes if I'm not there. And the doctor said, oh, we can't do that. You know, you've, you've got to stay here. 
and stay on the IV. I said, okay, well then you just bring me a bring me a form and I'll sign out against medical advice. I said, because that's my first responsibility. This isn't my first responsibility. That's my first responsibility. Finally, the doctor said, okay, okay, all right, all right, we'll do it your way. What we'll do is we'll unhook the IV, we'll let you go to church, and you come straight back, and as soon as you come back, we're going to put that IV right back in. I said, okay, we'll do it that way. Three hospitalizations this summer of 2000. That's how I did things. I told you, this preacher comes from old-time Pentecostal stock. I take my ministry very seriously. This is no joke to me, folks. This is serious business. Souls hang in the balance. Eternity hangs in the balance. God's people need to be fed. Well, kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Finally, after three hospitalizations, one day I fell out on the floor, couldn't breathe. I called the visiting nurse they had come into my house. And I told her, I said, I've got pneumonia. I know I've got pneumonia. I can feel it. She said, well, it sounds like you may. She said, you need to go to the doctor immediately. This was on a, I want to say Friday or Saturday. I said, no. I said, I'm going to wait till after Sunday. I got church Sunday. I said, after I go to church, after we have church Sunday, I'll drive to the doctor Monday. Ask Tommy how stubborn I am. See if, if I'm making this up. Said, I've got church Sunday. I said, I've already been in the hospital three times this summer. I've already had to get out every Sunday. You know, I said, no, 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 let me wait till after Sunday. Then I'll go see the doctor. So Monday morning came. I drove to the doctor's. Long story short, I went in the doctor's. They had to put me in a wheelchair immediately. I was loose and straight so fast I couldn't see straight. They put the oxygen reader on my finger. My oxygen level was so low, they immediately had to put an oxygen mask on me and start to give me oxygen. Sent me across the street to the Yuma Haven Hospital. They did an x-ray. The doctor came in the room after they had done the x-ray, and he looked at me and he said, Charles, you're not going to like what I have to say. I said, well, what is it? I said, you make it sound so dire. So, so dire. That was the exact wording I used. And he looked at me and he said, it is. It really is. He said, um, your lungs are so full of fluid that I'm not sure we're going to be able to save your life. He said, you are in very bad shape. You've got double pneumonia. He said, your lungs are full. He said, no, we need to put you in the hospital right away. That's about all I remember. Next thing you know, I was unconscious. I was in the hospital. When I woke up, I was on full life support. They had me fully intubated. Um, here in the machines, you know how that works. So, <laughs> my mother's there. My mother and her husband, my stepdad, they lived in Texas. All of a sudden, they're in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm looking, and they've got my hands tied tethered to the sides of the bed because when you're on intubation they don't want you trying to pull the tubes out of your nose and out of your throat and they have them everywhere else too you know and they don't want you trying to pull all these tubes out and stuff and the nurse come in and she said now if, if I take if I unhook your hands from the side of the bed she said I can give you crayons and some paper and if you want to say anything to your mother you can write it she said, we can't give you pencils because you might poke yourself or stab yourself. When you're intubated, you're on some powerful drugs. You can hallucinate. You can, I did hallucinate. I saw all kinds of things and thought I was experienced on all kinds of weird things. Oh, I went through quite a time. I was on life support for a month. I was in the hospital two months. They told my family for that entire month, he has 24 hours to live. My mother said for an entire month, they kept telling her over and over again, he'll be dead within a day, he'll be dead within a day, he'll be dead within a day. She said every time the phone rang, I knew they were calling to tell me that you had died. She said every time the phone rang, my heart just went through the floor, scared me to death. My family was coming in and spending time with me. I had no idea they were there. I was in and out of consciousness. Sometimes I'd be alert, sometimes I wouldn't. I'd see the ceiling on fire. 
I see all kind of weird things and then I look around the other. I look in the hall and the doctors and nurses are walking like normal but the ceiling's on fire. And in my mind, I don't know <laughs> how I was able to do this, but I was able to put two and two together and I said, well, I must be seeing things because if the ceiling were on fire, surely these people aren't going to be walking around like they're walking around, you know. But I couldn't talk. I was intubated, so I couldn't talk or anything. I went through a month on life support. Finally, my mother happened to be on my uh, computer at home. My best friend, Jose, uh, signed on to my computer for her, and she was able to use it. And she happened to come across the name of a preacher. Guess what? He's LGBT. He pastors the church, or pastored at the time. Now he's retired. But he pastored a church at the time, spirit-filled, just like this one. Just like what we're trying to do. But he was in Phoenix, Arizona. She ran across his name somewhere in my computer, and she said, at the minute I saw his name, she said, I knew that I'd heard you talk about him. So I sent him a message, and I told him, my son, is. they say he's got 24 hours to live, and blah, 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 blah. Brother Ronnie and his church got around a prayer cloth. They anointed a handkerchief with oil and prayed over it. This is an old Pentecostal custom, you know, an old spirit-filled church custom. Comes from the Word of God. I won't go into all the details, but they prayed over a prayer cloth for me. They put it in the mail. Uh, overnight Express through... Uh, Federal Express and they send it to me overnight and brother Ronnie wrote a nice little handwritten note he said brother you can't go anywhere we need you in this movement we need you don't you go anywhere we're believing God for a miracle for you my mother brought the envelope in to me in the hospital I I felt it I knew what it was before I ever opened it you know I could feel the cushiness of it you know I said oh they sent me a prayer cloth I know what this is my mother had to open the package. I could not, did not have the strength to open a Federal Express envelope. Literally, didn't have the strength to open it. My mother tore it open for me, you know, and uh, pulled that little tab, that little zipper tab, you know. I reached in and my mother uh, handed her the letter and she read it to me. I reached in, I could feel that prayer cloth. And laying there on that bed, I was so tired. I was so exhausted. My God, I'd never been so sick in my life. I was down to 135 pounds. You're looking at 250. I was down to 130, almost half my body weight. I said, Lord, these people will believe in you for a miracle. And I said, I'll be hanged if I'm going to make you look like a liar. <laughs> I said, if they're believing you for a miracle, then I don't have any choice but to believe you for a miracle. And I'm saying this in my mind because I can't talk, obviously. And the next words were, let's get it done. That I'll never forget it as long as I live. That's exactly the thought that I had. Let's get it done. The next day I woke up. A couple hours later, the doctor came in and he said, something's happening. He said, we don't know what's going on. He said, but your lungs are empty and things are starting to clear up. He said, it happened overnight. We can't figure out what's caused it. We can't figure out what's going on. He said, but we need to get you off of this intubation. And he said, well, I think maybe you might be able to support your own breathing. And they took me off the intubation and I could breathe myself. They had tried to take me off two weeks earlier. It didn't work. They had to reintubate me, but that's a whole other story. God gave me a miracle, folks. He knew that the only reason I had to live, and I, and I mean literally, he and I had talked about this, was the ministry that I was doing. And the ministry I was doing then is the same ministry I'm doing now. To the same people that I ministered to now with the same message that I'm preaching now and I told the Lord then it took me a while to figure it out but I told the Lord I said Lord I can't go anywhere I said I I've got too much work to do there's nobody in the wings there aren't you know hundreds of us preachers 
just waiting. If I were to die tomorrow, there's nobody going to walk in here and say, well, I'll take over this work, you know. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. They'll have to close it up, shut everything down, and, you know, it's over. There are not a lot of us out there. And I said, Lord, I can't go anywhere. I said, the work that I'm doing is so important. I said, dear God, I, I have to just keep pressing on. And he gave me a miracle, knowing good and well exactly what I was going to do and what I was going to continue to do. So don't tell me that God doesn't approve of an LGBT affirming spirit-filled ministry. Because, honey, you're talking to the wrong duck. I have seen more miracles in my life. I have seen more healings in my own body than I can count. There is a reason why God works through the church in the realms of signs and wonders. Peter said that Jesus was a man approved of God among us. And how was he approved? How was it demonstrated that God was with him and working through him, it was through his signs and wonders. That's how you knew that Jesus was on the right track. But that does not mean that signs and wonders in the church today serve the same purpose for us. It's not about being a seal of approval on us. No, but there is a purpose for signs and wonders. Listen. In John chapter 14, verses 15 through 20, the Lord said, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, Listen to what Jesus said. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Hmm. Interesting way of wording things. I will not leave you comfortless. Listen. I will come to you. See, we get this Holy Ghost thing all mixed up. We get it all screwed up. Listen. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father and ye in me. And I in you. The Holy Ghost, my friend, is nothing more nor anything less than the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He says, I've been with you, but I'm going to be in you. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. He said, I've been with you, but I... See, you got to understand this. This is important. If you're going to understand the purpose of signs and wonders, you have to understand this. Now listen. In John 14, verse 12, it said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my Father. After the Holy Ghost comes, after the presence of the Lord comes back spiritually so that he no longer is with us as a man but in us as a spirit. He said greater works than these so they do which come after me. He then goes on in John chapter 7 verses 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. See, he couldn't come back in the Spirit until he left in the flesh. 
Mm -hmm. All right? Now listen, after his ascension, the Lord would return invisibly to the church. No longer living with us as a man, but now living in us by his spirit. Now he is able to do many times over the, uh, those things that the limitations of a singular human existence created for him. As a single human being, he was confined to one place at one time. He could heal those that were in his immediate vicinity. But now, being in the church by his spirit, he's able to minister to millions around the world all at the same time. Because he ministers through us. Matthew 11, 20 through 24, Then began he to upbraid the cities. This is Jesus. He began to rebuke the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. Because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Shorazam. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, listen to this, my friend who wants to claim that Sodom and Gomorrah committed the greatest sins on the planet, and there's no greater sin than Sodom, of course. He said, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. See, there's a purpose for signs and wonders. He said, man, you, you cities have seen some of the mightiest things moves of God. You've seen the Lord do some of the greatest things and you still haven't repented. Said if Sodom and Gomorrah had experienced these things, if they'd have seen these things, they'd still be here. And by the way, if just, just so there'd be no confusion, our Wednesday night Bible studies, uh, we just began a brand new series on Wednesday night. Uh, I'm simply calling it LGBT Affirming Theology. And we are going through every biblical passage that is commonly used to bash and abuse and mistreat LGBT people. And uh, we are doing a very uh, uh, extensive uh, look at these passages. And uh, so that's on Wednesday night. So if you're at all interested in that, you also can watch it online because our Wednesday night is also shared online. And that's through both Facebook and YouTube. And if you're not available Wednesday night to watch it, you're still able to uh, go to our YouTube channel and watch it at any time. We started this last Wednesday with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And believe me, it's not what... People say it is. So if you get a chance, you might want to check that out. The Word of God said in Matthew 16, 14 through 20, I'm trying to hurry afterwards, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. This is after his resurrection. And upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them. Not may, not might, not could, not can. Shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall recover. 
so that after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And listen to this. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. There is a purpose for signs and wonders. But signs and wonders are not there, preacher, so that people can think you're something special. No. Signs and wonders are there, listen, to confirm the word. Hallelujah. It's all about proving that God keeps his word. Oh, but they serve another purpose. Another important purpose. Because the Spirit of God is operating through the church now, they demonstrate and reveal to the world that Jesus Christ is in fact and indeed resurrected from the dead and alive forevermore. Hallelujah. They demonstrate to the world indeed that He was not a creation of God but that he was the creator. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, the signs and wonders that are demonstrated through the church are not there to make us look special, but they're there to glorify him. Hallelujah. They're there to demonstrate his divinity. They're there to demonstrate his reality. They're there to demonstrate that Jesus Christ was and is who he said he was and is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He was not just a man, but he was God incarnate. Hallelujah. The living presence and power of a, of a living God. Acts 4 and 10, in response to the lame man's healing at the beautiful uh, gate of the temple, Peter said, be it, none, uh, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Christ, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him this man stand here before you whole. You remember in my primary text of that miracle? Peter said, you all think it's by our, somehow or another, it has something to do with us. You think it has to do with our perfection. You think it has to do with our holiness. How many preachers you know try to act like just that? Oh, my Lord. But that's not the purpose of science and wonders. It's not to show how wonderful and holy you are. No, 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 no. It's to show that he is who he said he was. Hallelujah. It's to show you that when we preach a resurrected Christ, we're telling the truth because even to this day, at the name of Jesus, demons have to bow a knee. Hallelujah. Even to this day, at the name of Jesus, sickness and disease have to give way to glory and healing and miracles. Praise the name of the Lord. Try and real I promise I'm trying to close up quick as I can. Acts 4, 29 through and 30. The apostles are in prayer after being threatened to no longer preach in the name of the Lord. And this is what they pray. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. Listen. By stretching forth thine hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's a sad thing. This, I'm so old-fashioned, I swear to God, I'm right there with the dinosaurs. Theologically, I go way back. I still believe in a God of miracles. I still believe that Amen. God heals. I still believe God delivers. I've seen people with drug addictions, alcohol addictions, cigarette addiction. I've seen God break those addictions in a moment's time, literally. I've seen God deliver in a moment's time. I've seen people who were so full of demons that they couldn't even function in society, literally. 
And the Lord delivered them, and all of a sudden they were of sound mind. All of a sudden they were back in the real world. They were functioning as a human being ought to be able to function. Oh, I want to tell you today, yeah, I'm foolish enough to believe that God is still a God of signs and wonders. Many preach a message that is in and of itself true. It inspires faith and it encourages believers to reach out to the Lord to receive the blessings, the healings, and miracles that they so desperately need. Yet even in preaching a true message, they do so for reasons that are self-glorifying. They try to suggest that signs are God's endorsement of them rather than the Lord's revelation and testimony to His own resurrection and power. Signs and wonders are not so much an endorsement of the individual as they are a confirmation of the individual's message. Oh my goodness. Anyone who reaches out to the Lord in faith can receive a miracle from God regardless of the preacher's true intent or motivation. That's why you can have someone out there who's a charlatan and their motivation may be money, 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 money. But you know what? People still receive miracles because what they're saying concerning God, what they're saying concerning healings, what they're saying concerning faith is true. And if people embrace that and they believe that, they can receive from the Lord what they need. It has nothing to matter what that guy's motivation is as long as their message is right. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 10, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. This is speaking of the Antichrist. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You might say, Pastor, why are you including this passage? Because I know there's a lot of people out there who try to lump miracles and signs and wonders all into the same ball. You know, I, I, there's a lot of good Baptist folk out there who will try to tell you that, oh, God doesn't do that anymore. Oh, the Lord doesn't heal anymore. There's no such thing as miracles anymore. Those are lying signs and wonders. No, they're not. Because the Antichrist will not be doing anything in Jesus' name. He will not be doing anything and giving the glory to God. No, everything he does is going to be done in order to make people believe that he has that power. That he is the source. Do you follow what I'm telling you? So you can't say that every miracle that you see today and every healing that you see today is a quote lying sign and wonder. No, it is not. <laughs> not by a million miles. Because everything that is done in the name of the Lord, everything that happens in the glory goes back to God, is God's. Hallelujah. Lastly, this afternoon, Colossians 3.17 tells us, And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. In the end, the purpose of miracles, signs, and wonders is to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is He who is demonstrating and manifesting Himself through us and through our Word. They are not meant to elevate us in any way, but rather they are meant always to elevate Him. Yes. In the words of the great old hymn of the church, to God 
be the glory. Great things he hath done. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. Amen. All